Okay, let's play some damn chess. This world is fucking trash. Stupid! Stupid bitch. What a stupid motherfucker. I'm fixing the ear, you rock. Stupid bitch. <laughs> I'm fixing it. I'm fixing it. God damn. I'm fixing it. Ear, your rook. I cutting off your left ear. You fucking bitch. I got two words of advice for you. I got one word of advice for you. Resign. You fucking bitch. Shit. Come on, you fucking bitch. You think you're gonna ear my rook? You got you got another thing coming, you fucking dumbass bitch. Fucking dumbass bitch. Your fucking brand plan to ear my rook ended up exploding in your fucking face, didn't it, you bitch? <laughs> Stupid bitch. No. No. I just eared your fucking rook, you fucking bitch. So sucks. Come on, you stupid bitch. Fucking bitch. Bed. I thought you had my You fucking bitch you fucked up you stupid bitch 
You suck my dick, bitch. You are gonna... I'm gonna fuck up your chick. I'm gonna fuck up your cash, you fucking bitch. Spit, spit. You fucking bitch. Man, this guy's adult. Fucking bitch. Stupid. Now I'm gonna beat you the old fashioned ray. I'm gonna end it. Whispering no, no. I fucked his hole.
fucking bitch. Move. These fucking pawns. Come on, you fucking bitch. I gotta get rid of these fucking poems. You stupid fucking bitch. Damn it. God fucking damn it. God fucking damn it. God fuck it. Son of a bitch! So on, all to isolate people and stop them from loving each other. Some 
much anger in the United States that's very, very disturbing. When you were with him, did Jesus say anything to you that would prepare you for the days in which we're now living? Do you have anything you think that Jesus would like you to pass on by way of encouragement or hope? Because many people's faith is faltering as they see the darkness and fear and confusion that's engulfing the world. Is there anything that you can share? What I'm getting from God, what I'm getting from Jesus is that the most important thing that we need to do is form community. There's another name for community. It's called church. And church is not a building. I mean, I love church buildings. As a matter of fact, I love church buildings a lot. Chart Cathedral in Chart, France was the highlight of my life. The most beautiful church Fuck it. cathedral in the world. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about community. A church community can be uh, two or three. A church community can be an God, Alcoholics Anonymous group. Church can be a Bible study. Church can be a uh, group of people that like to um, make good music, hopefully praise music together or you know, sing together. I just this morning watched a program on the Jubilee uh, Singers from Fisk University in um, Tennessee. And I'll tell you what, they were doing church. This, God, um, fuck choir. it. They were doing church. I mean, they were, they were church, you know, um, community where people come together, work together cooperatively in harmony and, um, you know, have a, a love of God and a love for one another. If you think you're going to survive these times ahead by getting a whole bunch of automatic weapons and stocking up on uh, supplies, doing that on your own, um, you're deceiving yourself. The, the only thing that's going to um, get us through these hard times is a community where we can love and support each other, not just affection, but more importantly, um, in meaningful ways. You're listening to an international edition of Nightlight, shining God's love light to the world. Howard, thank you again for coming on the program and for all those fascinating insights you've given us into the afterlife, especially for the lessons of love that we can immediately apply to our lives right now. I'm certainly looking forward to reading your book, Descent into Death, as well as the other books that you've written. I believe they're all that motherfucker could have put me Amazon in the fucking checkmate, but the motherfucker the fucked up. The, the one thing fucking I want to bitch. people want to know uh, any more about me, I have a website, howardstorm.com. And it's got, I've written four books, and it's got links to those, and a little bit about my life, and a um, really great picture of me and my dog. Uh, I love that picture. And uh, anyways, there's also, uh, there's a contact point, and if they um, fill out the contact, that comes directly to me. People always say, oh, I want this to go to Howard Storm, not a staff. I don't have a staff. I wish I had a staff. <laughs> no, but... It's, this is a one-man show here, one-man operation. So if you if you try and contact me, you will. And of course, you have quite a few interviews posted on YouTube. People can just search for you on YouTube and hear a lot more details of your story. Come on, and bitch. Many other life after death stories on YouTube too. I mean, now that everybody has video cameras on their mobile phones, it's so easy for people to film their own testimonies and put them up on YouTube. You know. <laughs> Man, I just no, I aired your rook. You stupid fucking bitch. YouTube, the social media platforms didn't even get rolling until 10 or 15 years ago. So um, people would invite me. I was almost always to churches, and I would give my testimony. Stupid! He I, and the thing I, I, I and the thing I about resign this game. And then uh, I started uh, eventually start to get emails. I saw your testimony on YouTube. Oh, I didn't know there was such. A, that's when I talked to like the Methodist Church or at the you know Baptist Church or whatever. All of a sudden, I became well known on the internet and started getting emails from all over the world. And when I mean all over the world, I'm talking about India and South America and France and Sweden and you know Hawaii and you know China and blah blah blah. And it's like. I once said to someone, you know, I'm famous on the internet. They said, don't ever say you're famous. That sounds so vain. And I said, okay, so I can't say I'm famous, but I'm well known by a group of people on the web, on the internet. And the interesting thing, I've never put anything on the internet. 
It's just people do that. I mean, I, I they ask me to do an interview, I do the interview, and then uh, whoop, it appears magically. Nightlight. What a delight. I'll tell you why I do this. I think you, you know without me telling you. It's like God gave me a gift. He gave me a testimony. And I could do one of two. I didn't, black shit. I didn't actually believe you were going to do that stupid shit. About myself because I have this wonderful Fucking experience, bitch. you know, and keep it to myself and go about my life. Think about what a fortunate person I am. Or the alternative is, sure. <laughs> stupid bitch. You stupid bitch. I fuck I his hole. I stuck my dick up his butt. He's the author of Descent into Death, a second chance at life. On Nightlight a couple of weeks ago, Howard shared with us his story, and I invited our listeners to email me any questions that they might have, and I've compiled these to ask Howard, who's speaking to us once again from his home in rural Kentucky. Well, Welcome back to Nightlight, Howard. We have a guest tonight on Nightlight. Howard, the first question I have is from Alfredo in Venezuela, and he was actually the one who suggested that I interview you for this program, and he also wrote to you and put us in touch. So thanks so much for doing that, Alfredo. Anyway, Alfredo asks, who were those dark creatures that were waiting for you outside of the hospital room? Were they demons? Okay. Um, I get that question a fair amount. My friends, we've completed a review of the book. Friend God, life with Jesus. Discussed to some degree all the twenty chapters, and I hope that it was a blessing to you. Not, not, not how to stir you, fucking bitch. A couple bitch. weeks ago, I asked if anybody had any questions to send them to me, and many of you have. I have uh, right now thirty-seven questions that people um, responded to to be answered through this um, YouTube video program. And I will be ordering them, I will be answering them in the order that they arrived. So uh, please be patient. And for the sake of uh, people's security and privacy, I'm gonna uh, only refer to the first name and the country of origin of the person who asked the question. The people who are listening, who've asked the question, still know who they are because of, say, their name and their country and possibly the um, city, if it's a big city. And they'll know by the questions that it's them. Mm. Um, but I am concerned about uh, keeping everybody's uh, privacy intact. So, a um, whole range of questions all over the place, all over the map, and I'm going to try and answer them all uh, carefully and take them all um, seriously and um, as much as possible give some kind of Bible reference, uh, and hopefully you'll look at the Bible reference and my response in relationship to the biblical reference will make um, more sense. So, I'm going to begin with Emilia from Sofia, Bulgaria. Uh, she and I have uh, corresponded before and uh, seemed to be a very wonderful lady, asked some um, really good questions. So she wanted advice about people who are suffering from physical ailments and are faint of heart 
or afraid. Uh, for people who do not have enough faith and feel that they don't have a um, strong connection to God. Um, and then her second question is, how do you deal with um, fear in your life? Whether it be fear of loss, suffering, or anything else that you might be afraid of. And then she comments, I guess these two questions are pretty similar. Well, I think they, they are very similar, and I think my um, response is appropriate for both of them. One of my favorite scriptures that I think addresses this question correctly, I want to summarize it by you take it to Jesus. That's how you do it. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, verse 28, I want to read um, 28 through 30 because it's such a wonderful scripture, and I hope that um, Emily and others of you who have uh, this kind of question would um, look at this. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy my burden is light. I, I love that scripture. When I think of that scripture, I think of um, a pair of oxen yoked. Typically yoked. You will find rest from the weird that um, Emilia and others of you who have uh, this kind of question would um, look at this. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I, I love that scripture. When I think of that scripture, I think of... Um, pair of oxen yoked. Typically, yokes were made for two animals, though it is possible to have a single yoke. Um, and I think of Jesus on one side and him inviting us to be on the other side of the yoke. Um, but he says that He's gentle and humble in heart, and that we will find rest for our souls. And this last line is just a line of radio. The fuck was that? From my stupid! My I think that, that was peace, fucking stupid, love, bitch. The joy, the hope, the faith. That, that was fucking Jesus stupid as gives. fuck does in fact make our burdens light. And whether the burdens are from uh, physical ailments, fears, anxieties, psychological troubles, family troubles, Shit. financial problems, Jesus gives us the strength to persevere and not only endure through all these things, but actually be victorious through them all. I have some other... Um, scriptures that I the relevant matter of fact I have a lot of scriptures I made a whole list of scriptures that were, so I, I'll uh, read one or two more and then I'll, I'll give you a list of some other scriptures that you might want to look up um, Matthew 17 7 um, after the uh Transfiguration. Uh, Peter, James, and John uh, were over overcome by fear. They fell to the ground. <laughs> and Jesus said to them, Get up and do not be afraid. I really believe that 
Fear is one end of the spectrum, and faith is the other. I think that the opposite of faith is not unbelief. The opposite of faith is fear. And I think that's one of the reasons why people are reluctant to really put their faith which is the same thing as trust in Jesus because they're afraid that it may not work or he may let them down or they may not be good enough or for whatever reason they're reluctant to do it. But with faith, we're given the strength to endure everything, to persevere through everything and really ultimately to be victorious through all of it. A few other references that have to do with um, fear and faith Matthew twenty eight ten. You see, I'm setting up it. I'm it's setting him up to ear his work. Just as long as he does a fucking cast on me, that fucking king. Luke twelve four. So I hope that a uh, person will look at these scriptures and realize that the the battle with fear is finding Jesus and putting all of your faith completely in Him and letting him give you the strength and the wisdom to deal with whatever you're going through. The um, next question that Emily uh, um, asked, what methods do you use to calm your mind? And she talks about how hard it is sometimes to pray um, because you get all these thoughts and things racing through your head. Man, this guy's fucking stupid. Meditation, they call all that random stuff going through your head the monkey mind. That is a great image. Your mind's just sort of jumping around, jumping around, jumping around, you know, with all these thoughts and you can't, like, really focus. You can't concentrate on what you want to um, focus on. This is where... Uh, How the fuck did he get a 1,200 really rating? Many, many times. Well, I'm, I'm, got, I'm probably going to kick his ass so and he's going to have a 958 for six rating. To recite prayers that I know. And if you want to go to a source book of great prayers, open the Bible up in the middle to the book of Psalms. And there's 150 great prayers. They're all wonderful. And those will help you get focused and concentrated when you get involved with this person. But, um, Ooh, a prayer that helps me a lot that I use all the time is called the Jesus Prayer. And there's a uh, number of variations on it. The way Shit. that I say it, because it's, I like this form of it, is Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. I am a sinner redeemed by your love. The shortest version of that is <laughs> Jesus have mercy I just on me. eared his rush. Which is right from Late the Bible. Late in the game, not cutting off his right ear. Um, but I like to say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. I am a sinner redeemed by your love. And I say that several times, minimally three times, sometimes um, as many as I feel that I need to. It really helps me focus on where I want my prayers to go. Of course, the Lord's Prayer is a great prayer to get focused. And um, no. I would assume that everyone's familiar with it or could be easily familiar with it. And another favorite, which is um, called the most well-known verses in the Bible is the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, leaving this by He leads me beside still waters, he restores my soul, etc. Um, when you can't focus on your prayer, when your mind is racing around, I'm suggesting Jesus' prayer, Lord's prayer, 23rd Psalm, any combination of those, and all the Psalms. And there's a whole huge variety of psalms, and the more you um, become familiar with them, you tend to um, develop your favorites. I'll give you one of my favorites. And it's, I, I just think it's a great psalm, 139. 
Yep. He was a dumbass masquerader in the 12th and rate. That will really help your prayer life. Help you focus on dumbass. the things that you need to pray for. Mark from uh, Piedmont, South Carolina. Um, he is asking about the um, question I asked Jesus, why is there evil and Jesus talked to me as an artist and used the analogy of colors how uh, you can't paint with just one color, you need a whole variety of colors and it's the contrast and um, so his question is did God really create evil for the sole purpose of variety? Does that mean that evil is part of the will of God? The short answer is approximately yes. I believe that everything in the universe, everything, space, energy, matter, time, everything was created by God. I do not believe that God micromanages everything in the universe. I don't believe that God is micromanaging, you know, how the uh, subatomic particles uh, interact with one another inside the atom. I don't believe that the atom, uh, God is micromanaging how the atoms are uh, interacting inside molecules. I don't believe that uh, God is uh, managing the bacteria and the viruses that live in this world. I don't believe that God is micromanaging uh, any of us. And especially, I think human beings have been given the gift of free will. God in this world because of the free will that we were given knew that we needed to be tested um, there can be no free will without a choice there can be you can't choose good if you are not tempted by evil and I think a good um understanding of what the evil one is, is he's the tempter. Look at the book of Job in the Bible. That's his role. God gives him that task. Put Job to the test. And that's um, one of the early big appearances of the evil one in the Bible. And um, I don't know if you're aware of it, but most scholars consider the book of Job to be one of the oldest books in the Bible. Very, very ancient piece of wisdom literature. So, response to the question, um, did God create evil? Genesis 1, 31. God saw everything he made, and indeed it was very good, and that was the evening, and that was the morning, the sixth day. God made the world to be good, but there are elements in the world that have rebelled against God, turned away from God, and don't do good. And God uses as it says in Romans 8.28, all things work for God's good purpose for those who love God. So we are in a world where God wants good, God's intention is good. Oh, I'm picking God's fuck this God's goal but... is good and for us to be good. But uh, in the meantime, we struggle with our nature be rebellious, meaning sinful, um, and not doing
doing God's will. I would like you to look at um, Romans chapter 5. It's an amazing bit of scripture by St. Paul. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. Not only that, Man, that but we also boast stupid. in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. Hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our heart. The I'm Holy getting Spirit all into this fucking business. Sometime, if you have a chance, look up the meaning of the word character. It comes from the Greek meaning to stamp a coin. And I love that image because uh, the way that you stamp a coin is you have. Um, a very hard metal with an impression in it. It's the actual negative image of what you want to um, press upon the coin, which would be the positive image. And you put that over a softer piece of metal, and then you take um, a very big hammer and you pound that impression into the metal. That's what makes character. Character isn't made. All right, fuck. He is. Um, oh! By having uh, nice little tea parties. Character is made when. Well, that's the way chess is supposed to be played. Go the suffering. I don't think it's just me. I've learned more through my struggles and through my sufferings than through my joys. That's the way chess is supposed times. to be played. Where well, both of you got all your things, pieces. So. If somebody puts you, really you puts your astro in a checkmate. Those quick wins. With the tempter. Man, I fucked that guy. But character. And that character has <laughs> hope. <laughs> I stuck my dick up um, that guy's. Uh, I stuck my dick up that guy's butt. Another one from Bulgaria, but this is Emil fucking bitch. And uh, Emil writes a very long uh, question about <coughs> uh, the vaccines. And he um, subsequently followed this up with a, a much longer, like a two-page email full of uh, Oh. 
Fucking pip, you fucking bitch. You suck my motherfucking dick, bitch.
Now be a dumbass and bring that fucking work out of here. I'm gonna ask the fuck out of you, fucking bitch. Son of a bitch, I fucked up. No, you fucked up, bitch. <laughs> I fucked his hoe! Let's see if I can ear his rook. I'm facing the ear, your rook. I cut off his right ear. That is really fucking stupid. <laughs>
I think I finally got this. Yep, I'm finally picking my ass up the fucking whore. You suck my dick, bitch. Fucking bitch. Shit. Fucking you a butt like a pro. Suck my dick, bitch. Man, I'm fucking I fuck his hole. I stick my. I stuck. I stuck my. Dick. Think of his butt. Man. With Uzi spit. Come on, you bitch.
I lose my fucking grip? Chase that whore to fucking kingdom motherfucking come, bitch. I chased that fucking whore to keen the motherfucking cutting, bitch. Fucking bitch. Come on, you dick sucker. Come on, dick sucker. Fucking bitch. You suck my dick, bitch. You suck my dick, bitch. You suck, you suck my dick, bitch. You suck my dick, bitch. No, 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 no.
you fucking bitch. Pancakes, pancakes on fucking, fucking goddamn bitch. 